Hebrews chapter 4, verses 9 through 16. You may notice today that I'm standing. Last week I, I sat as if we were doing a Bible study. And I'm going to tell you, I find it hard. It's, it's really difficult to sing sitting. But then also when I'm preaching, uh, I don't know why, but I just don't hardly feel respectful sitting. So I said, Lord, I'm going to have to find a way to stand up. So we were able to reconfigure our space a little bit so that I can stand as I preach the word of the Lord. Amen. Hebrews chapter 4, beginning at verse number 9, reading through verse 16. The King James text today reads, There remaineth therefore a rest to the people of God. For he that is entered into his rest, he also hath ceased from his own works, as God did from his. Let us labor therefore to enter into that rest, lest any man fall after the same example of unbelief. For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight, but all things are naked and opened unto the eyes of him with whom we have to do. Seeing then that we have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession. For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore... Listen, children, let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace, hallelujah, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Praise the name of the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. I want to talk to us for a while today on the topic, use your umbrella. Hallelujah. Use your umbrella. If you bow your heads with me one more time, King Jesus, Savior of lost humanity, God manifest in human form. We love you today. We thank you, Master for the lengths to which you have gone to bring salvation to the lost. We appreciate today, O oh God, the salvation that you have afforded us through the born-again experience, born of water, born of the Spirit. We thank you for the revelation of Jesus' name. O oh Master, the power in the name of the Lord. Oh, there's no other name given among men under heaven whereby we must be saved. And we thank you, Master, for the revelation of Jesus' name, baptism for the remission of sin. We thank you for the Holy Ghost baptism, which breathes new life into our spiritual man. Oh, God, and places the power within us that is necessary to rise in the final resurrection, that we might join you in the air if we have somehow met our end before that time comes and allows us to leap from this earth 
into the very clouds of glory to gather with you and those who have gone on before if we yet remain. Master, today anoint the man of God. Let the word of the Lord go forth, O oh God, with power, with authority in love. Help it to find its mark in the heart and in the hearing of every individual who might watch this service, whether they be watching live, whether they're watching later, by reason of recording. Master, anoint me today. How on earth can I be of any benefit to any child of God or any unbeliever needing to be saved, if not for the anointing of the Holy Ghost, the touch from heaven? Master, today move through this message. Perform that for which you would send it forth. For we ask it in none other than Jesus Wonderful, wonderful name. Praise the name of the Lord. Praise God. You know, children, the Lord has promised rest to his people. And yet, sadly, today there are so few who will ever truly know what it is to find and experience that rest which the Master has promised. I don't know about you all, but... I don't know that there's anything quite so uncomfortable as being rained upon and getting soaking wet. I had to go the other day to Kroger, and as I was parking my car, don't you know, the rain just decided it wanted to fall. All of a sudden, it just began to come down in torrents until the moment I put my car in park, uh, it was just misting a little, you know, it was just dripping here and there. But it seemed like the minute I put my car in park, here come the rain. And I sat there for a minute and I said, you know, I'm, I'm, not, uh, I, I'm not so petite and, and so uh, weak that I feel like rain is going to melt me and turn me into a, a big old uh, puddle of mud. I know better than that. But at the same time, there's nothing quite so uncomfortable and so miserable as getting out stuck in the rain and just the water pouring over you and your clothes get wet and they begin to stick to your flesh and you you know, uh, you just get so uncomfortable and you get so miserable. And then when you come inside, it takes a good while for all that mist to dry out so you can return to a comfortable state. Well, while coming out of Kroger the other day, the rain was just coming down in buckets I just finished doing some shopping, and I'm watching a man walking toward the Kroger, an older man, and he had his umbrella, he had an umbrella in his hand, folded up underneath his arm, and he's walking through the rain with the umbrella folded underneath his arm. And I looked at this fellow, and I thought to myself, is there something wrong with you? <laughs> is there, what on earth is your problem? You've got an umbrella in your hand. You've got the tool you need to stay dry and to stay comfortable. But instead of opening it, you've got it under your armpit and you're rushing toward the building. I thought, you know what? He probably is bringing it for his wife or something. And he thinks it doesn't look manly to use an umbrella. He thinks somehow that's going to take away from his machismo if he actually opens that umbrella. Oh, he looks so much more manly walking through the rain with that umbrella under his arm. No, he didn't look manly. He looked dumb. He looked foolish. My Lord have mercy. People have such hang-ups about things, don't they? 
I thought, you know, he probably thinks, well, an umbrella's okay for the wife, but, you know, for me, I'm a man, bless God. I, I'm not, I know rain isn't going to melt me, so I'm fine. It's not about rain melting you. It's about you've got something available to you that can help you stay dry and comfortable. Why on earth would you not simply open it and make use of it? I want to read to you Hebrews chapter 3, verses 14 through 19. For we are made partakers of Christ. If we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast unto the end, while it is said, Today, if ye will hear his voice, harden not your hearts, as in the provocation. For some, when they had heard, did provoke, howbeit not all that came out of Egypt by Moses. But with whom was he grieved forty years? Was it not with them that had sinned, whose carcasses fell in the wilderness? And to whom swear he, that they should not enter into his rest, but to them that believed not. So we see that they could not enter in because of unbelief. Like that man walking through the rain with his umbrella under his arm, so it is today with many believers Many children of God walk about pelted by shame and guilt and condemnation when it is not at all necessary that they do so. God has provided us with grace and a means to quickly and easily dispatch of those things which otherwise hinder us or cause us great consternation. Many people will ultimately abandon their walk with the Lord altogether simply because they cannot seem to find relief from the rain that soaks them through with tears of self-doubt and self-condemnation. Sadly, they may well lose out in the end. And the reason for their falling short will not be the weakness or failure they displayed. It won't be the sin that they uh, tripped over, but rather it will be their inability. Listen, children, their inability to believe God and to take him at his word. Those whom the Lord refused access to the promised land, those who never found the rest that God had promised the children of Israel as they exited the bondage of Egypt, those who would not enter the promised land were guilty, my friend, of the sin of unbelief. We've got too many people run around every day of their Christian experience. It doesn't help that there are pastors and churches who think that it is their mission and their job to preach people into a pit of guilt and condemnation and fear and anxiety Sunday after Sunday after Sunday. It doesn't help that there are entire denominations whose theology is so messed up and so goofed up that they think somehow they're to search through and scour the Word of God until they find new sins and new offenses to bring to the people of God so that every Sunday they can somehow bring these people to the altar snotting and slobbering and weeping and wailing and crying out for mercy because they stand convinced that in spite of their 
trying with all their might to live for God day in and day out, week in and week out, month after month, year after year, decade after decade, in spite of their encounter with the Lord Jesus Christ at the cross of Calvary, they've been made to believe that the grace of God is weak and watery that it easily is dispersed, it easily is done away with. God easily abandons his grace in favor of judgment and condemnation and guilt. My friend, I'm here to tell you today that theology is wrong. It is pitifully wrong. That theology will help more people find hell than it will ever help people make heaven. Because that theology requires, listen to me now, that theology requires that you not understand and trust the promises of God's word. When you understand and trust the promises of God's word, then you understand that there is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. When you understand the promises of God's word, you understand things like uh, 1 John chapter 1 and verse 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Got news for you, children. When you can confess your sin to God and then walk out of the church still carrying a load of guilt, still carrying the shame, still carrying condemnation, the reality is you're not taking God at his word. You're not believing the promises of God, and in reality, God help us all, you're walking in unbelief. The people who do not find the rest that God has promised us in Hebrews 4 and verse 9, our primary text today, there remaineth therefore a rest to the people of God. The people who do not find that promised rest are those who have the word of God. Listen to me now. Who have the word of God at their disposal. Glory. They've got their Bible tidily tucked under their arm as they enter and exit the church each Sunday. But they never open their umbrella when the enemy tries to shower them with thoughts of guilt and shame, when he tries to shower them with words of condemnation, they sit there and they allow all that negativity, all that demonic attack to saturate them, to make them miserable, to make them uncomfortable. They never come into the rest that God has promised because they got the umbrella, but they're just not opening it. They're not using it. They've got the word of God, but they're not trusting it. They're not believing it. People say, how in the world can you be LGBT and think you're going to go to heaven? I said, I'll tell you how. <laughs> because I trust the promises of God. I trust the word of God. Whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. That's what my Bible says. And I believe the word of God. Whosoever whosoever, whosoever believeth on him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. Oh, I'm going to read to you a little more positive 
a statement from the word of God today. Revelation 14 and verse 3. And I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, that is to John the revelator, Write, blessed are the dead which die in the Lord from henceforth. Yea, saith the Spirit that they may rest from their labors and their works do follow them. Many believers will only find the rest that has been promised to them by the Lord after they have died. Yet God has promised us in this life that we might experience that rest. With this rest, comes joy. With this rest comes peace and freedom from guilt and condemnation. Jesus promised in Matthew eleven twenty eight, 28, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. The Lord's example prayer what we often refer to as the Lord's Prayer includes the words, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Well, I got news for you. God's will is that when you die, you enter into rest. And he wants his will for you to be as much a reality on earth as it is in heaven. He doesn't want you to have to die to find the peace and the joy that he has promised. He wants you to enter into that rest in the here and now. But you can't enter into that rest as long as you have the promises of God's word tucked under your arm rather than opening your umbrella. Let the enemy throw everything he wants to throw. I am covered. Hallelujah. I'm covered by the grace of God. In our primary text today, Hebrews 4, I love that very last verse, verse 16. Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Oh, that passage lets us know, children, we have the tools we need to stay dry. We have what we need to be comfortable. We have what we need to overcome the guilt and the shame. We have what we need to overcome the condemnation of the enemy. We have what we need. All we have to do is use our umbrella. Hallelujah. Don't just read the promises of God's word. Believe the promises of God's word. I'm here to tell you today those things which God has promised, which accompany his rest, that joy, that peace, that freedom from guilt and condemnation. These things are the possession of believers in this life and not just in the afterlife. If only we'll open our umbrella. Oh, concerning the Sabbath, the Apostle Paul in our primary text today likened the rest that God has promised his people to the Sabbath. And the Sabbath was given in order that it might be a spiritual uh, uh, demonstration or a, a likeness of a spiritual principle. And listen to what the Word of God says concerning the Sabbath in Deuteronomy 5. Verses 13 through 15. Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work. Thou nor thy son nor thy daughter nor thy manservant nor thy maidservant nor thine ox nor thine ass nor any of thy cattle nor thy stranger that is within thy gates. 
that thy manservant and thy maidservant may rest as well as thou. And remember that thou wast a servant in the land of Egypt, and that the Lord thy God brought thee out thence through a mighty hand and by a stretched out arm. Therefore the Lord thy God commanded thee to keep the Sabbath day. We struggle in this life under the weight of sin. The Israelites struggled to survive beneath the burden of Pharaoh's heavy hand. But when the Lord led his people out of Egypt, he led them to a place where they could find rest. The entire concept of the Sabbath was to be for the church a type or example of the rest we would experience from the works of the law. The law was focused solely and entirely upon works and human effort. The gospel of Jesus Christ is based solely and entirely upon grace through faith. Oh, children, that's rest. Salvation through Jesus Christ, listen to me, folks, is our Sabbath. Oh, praise the Lord. The law was the days of the week in which we had to work. Jesus came and said, no more works. Now you can rest. Oh, glory to God. said, I am your Sabbath. I am your rest. Oh, you go to so many churches today, they're still preaching the law. They're still preaching the rules and regulations, the do's and the don'ts. If they would just preach this good old-fashioned message of apostolic salvation, if they would just preach the truth of the Holy Ghost baptism, I'm going to tell you something. God will fix anything that needs to be fixed. He'll help you to live right. He'll help you to do right. He'll help you to act right. But children, it's not all on you anymore. It's not about what you're able to do, what you're not able to do. It's about whether or not you can believe the promises of his word. It's whether or not you can hold an umbrella in the rain or you can actually open it and use it. Because to use it, you have to exercise faith. Ephesians 2, 4 through 9, But God, who is rich in mercy, for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together in heavenly places in, Jesus, in Christ Jesus that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. You know, it's not true only of LGBT believers, but unfortunately, it is especially true of many LGBT believers. There are many who struggle and suffer their entire lives trying to live for God, never able to experience the rest that God has promised them, simply because they cannot understand or accept the grace which the Lord has afforded them. They hold the promise of God in their hand by reason of his word, yet they never find their way clear to open the umbrella. 
The enemy pelts them with guilt and shame and condemnation. And they just stand there in the showers of negativity and get soaking wet. In Romans 8, 1 through 6, there is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus, listen, hath made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin, condemned sin in the flesh, that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and death. Peace. Oh, children, I'm here today to tell you, when we become spiritually minded and understand the law of the spirit of life in Christ, listen now, we know that we have not simply exchanged one heavy burden for another at the altar of repentance. But rather we have laid down our debilitating load of sin, guilt, and shame, and we have taken up a new burden, one that is light and easy to bear. Now the greatest burden that we as believers need to bear, listen to me now, is nothing more than carrying the Master's book. Hallelujah. He has said, give me your sin and guilt and shame and carry instead only my word. The heaviest load that we need to bear as a child of God is the weight of our Bible. The rest is simply a matter of whether or not we can embrace what is written therein and walk by faith rather than by works. The last scripture passage I want to share with you today is 2 Corinthians 3, 5 through 11. Now that we, not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think anything of ourselves, but our sufficiency is of God who also hath made us able ministers of the New Testament, not of the letter, but of the Spirit. For the letter the law killeth, but the Spirit giveth life. But if the ministration of death, meaning the Old Testament law, written and engraved in stones, was glorious so that the children of Israel could not steadfastly behold the face of Moses for the glory of his countenance, which glory was to be done away, how shall not the ministration of the, of the Spirit be rather glorious? For if the ministration of condemnation be glory, much more doth the ministration of righteousness exceed in glory. For even that which was made glorious had no glory in this respect, 
by reason of the glory that excelleth. For if that which is done away was glorious, the law, much more that which remaineth is glorious. Hallelujah. Praise the name of the Lord. Oh, children of the Most High God, I want you to know this today. There's a reason why God engraved upon tablets of stone the law that was first given to Moses. This was done by the Lord himself, listen to me now, as an illustration of the truth that the law was a heavy load to bear. You ever wonder why God carved the Ten Commandments into tablets of stone that Moses then had to carefully try to bear down and, and carry down the mountain as he made his way back to the encampment of the children of Israel? It's because it was an illustration. The law is heavy. It is burdensome. It was not designed to be light. But the New Testament message of grace and faith is light. All we need to carry is the Word of God. All we need to do to access and avail ourselves of that which God has promised is believe Him. My Lord, have mercy, children. The only people in the Old Testament who didn't enter into the rest that God had promised the people of Israel were those who walked in unbelief. I got news for you. The only people in the New Testament who are not going to enter into and find the rest that God has promised them are those who walk in unbelief. They cannot read, understand, accept, and Act upon by faith the promises of God's sacred text. There is no need to work, to walk in the uncomfortable and health-threatening reigns of guilt, shame, and condemnation. We have been adopted into the family of God by grace through faith. We now hold in our hearts all we need to shield us from those things which otherwise weigh us down and make us miserable. We have been promised rest. We are afforded by the Master rest. Rest is our possession by faith in the promises of God's Word. You can have that rest today, which comes with peace that passeth all understanding. It comes with joy unspeakable and full of glory. And it comes with assurance that one day we shall see Him, for we shall be like Him. All you have to do, children, in order to access that grace, all you have to do today to shed the misery and the weight of guilt and shame and all this negativity that the enemy enjoys bringing on us, oftentimes while we're sitting in the pew of our local church, I might add. But all you have to do is... Use your umbrella. Hallelujah. Praise the name of the Lord.